to our next speaker. Dr. Eldridge, uh, Dr. Eldridge, Dr. Eldridge would be someone else entirely, more technical touch. More technical as well. Um, Elf Eldridge is president of the Wellington branch of the Royal Society of New Zealand, a PhD student in material science and nanotechnology. Um, active in science outreach, including a heroic effort to improve the ratio of knowledge to bollocks on chalkboard. Um, he's going to be talking about how to improve the level of public science literacy and is actually going to bring some science to the question, which is, well, go for the novelty battle, nothing else, right? Alright, so uh, everybody please welcome Elf Elbridge. Genetic lineage right there. 
and the apple hasn't fallen too far from the tree. <laughs> but um, to give you a bit of background, I, I grew up uh, as a farm boy over, over in the Wairau. Um, and growing up with your know, hands buried in a cow's bum or in a sheep's mouth or covered in shit and blood and the entrails, as happened to me on numerous occasions, gives you a, a really different view of the world to most people you run into. And then going from that into science has also skewed it. But this picture here describes how I kind of started out. I grew up on a farm, I love working with animals, despite being covered in shite and guts most of the time, and I decided I was going to be a vet. Uh, so I studied really, really hard, I thought I did, um, passed undergraduate papers-ish, got into vet school, and then was kicked out for not having bucks that were good enough, at which point I kind of lost it, and when, this is when I was about 18 or 19, I wanted to be a vet since I was six. They kicked me out. I literally, literally had no idea what I was going to do with my life. I hadn't even considered other options. It's, it's not entirely true. When I was, before I was six, before I wanted to be a vet, my dream job was to sell ice cream to the moon. Um, six, I realised that that wasn't necessarily the career track I was hoping for. Uh, and now I realise that there's a couple of physical limitations around that as well. Um, but I really had no idea what to do. But conveniently, I had fallen in love with physics and biology, being taught by the crazy people of the NASA, and one of them is actually from the McNeil Institute. <coughs> I always remember the first day I walked into his class, and he walked in. <coughs> Sorry, I'm going to mind this bit because I've like my mind. This is the first day of my physics class. Guy wearing a Hawaiian shirt, right? Khaki shorts, socks, and sandals. <laughs> you know where this is going if you've seen the visitors. He wanders in, he has long straight hair down here. His name is Bill Williams or Martin Williams. He goes like this. Ah! He says to run right the way around the edge of here. And he'd come back, put down his notes, and stand very quietly for a moment, and then ask what was going on. Um, and no one knew. He said, Oh, it's, it's a vicious cycle. <laughs> I worked myself laughing. I thought it was the funniest thing ever. But in a lecture theatre of 300 people, uh, it turns out I was one of the only ones that found it funny. Which is the first clue I thought, perhaps, you know, perhaps I should do physics and not biology. But did that, and what I do now is a little bit different. So I'm a physics PhD student, technically. I don't work on atomic bombs. Um, this is just the technology that I work with. It was developed because of nuclear warfare. It was developed by this guy called Wallace Cooper. Uh, he was very, very worried about the effects of nuclear radiation, and he wanted a device for rapidly counting red blood cells to see if he could see the effects of radiation. So he developed the Coulter counter. And what I work with, what I do all my research with, is a smaller version of the Coulter counter. Even though that was developed in the 1950s, we're still finding new ways to study it and make it interesting today. And if you want to know more about my PhD, don't talk to me about it. <laughs> my thesis is due in two months. Don't, don't talk to me about it. <laughs> but the reason I'm here today and the reason I started getting involved in science communication is in part because of these two guys. Now they look like my dad and they look like standard scientists, old border, balding, white men. Uh, the guy on your left is Sir Paul Callahan. And Sir Paul Callahan is, was, a fantastic physicist and a fantastic human being. I had the rare honour of having him as a mentor, a personal mentor, for a short period of time. And his vision and his joy in the discovery of science is what really sealed it for me as something that I wanted to do uh, with my life. He also set up the Mechanism Institute. Um, the guy on, on the right is possibly slightly more contentious. If you don't know who he is, his name is Sir Peter Gottman. He's currently the Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor as a, an esteemed colleague of mine once, says, once said, he tends to polarise people. Um, I've worked with Sir Peter a bit over the last few months, and I ultimately, sometimes within the same hour, love and hate this man. <laughs> but you can't argue with the fact that he's there, he's big, he's obvious, he's out there, he's shouting, he's waving his hands, so that's a lot more than most people do. But a few years ago, uh, Susie and myself and a number of other science bloggers went up to the Transit of Venus Forum, and this was a futures forum they held uh, up in Tolaga Bay, up on the east coast of New Zealand, to think about New Zealand's future in, in 20 years' time. Where do we want New Zealand to be? It was, uh, sorry, it was Sir Paul Callaghan's vision to set this up, and unfortunately Sir Paul passed away before he was able to chair it and run it through. So, Peter Gleichman, 
uh, took on the reins and encouraged everyone to turn up and talked at us when we were up there, as well as talking with a whole bunch of other people. And he finished the conference by recommending this. This is the Geek Manifesto. I hadn't heard of it at the time. And I'm one of these people that if you tell me to do something, unless there's a good reason for me to not do it, even if it's stupid, I'll probably go and do it. So, so Peter said, go and read this. So I went and read it. And I thought, oh, you know, this, this book's pretty good. Actually lines up with a lot of my own personal philosophies. And a number of people seem to be sending the same messages that are in this book. And I think you can kind of boil them down. And this, I, I apologize to the author because I'm completely cutting down on the book here. But it boils down for me to three things. The first is education. And I'm talking about science education or critical thinking of the public with <laughs> some humorous connotations. So I've been in the education system forever. I think parts of me are becoming fossilised to chairs at Victoria University at the moment because I've now, now been at Victoria for nine years. Before that I was at school and it feels like I will be a student forever, I guess. But it's something that I'm quite passionate about and something that I'm quite interested in. The second is inspiration. As in science, and in science uh, this is easy, right? This is choose. What, what example do you like? These are two of my favourites. So the Curiosity Rover. I was out at a career sphere a couple of weeks ago in my new mother. And I got up and I, I had all my speech plan and everything, and I never stick with it, so I don't know why I bother to write the damn things. Um, I stood up and I said, this engineering and science are a good career choice, and then I felt my soul kind of crack and break inside because it's so not a me thing to say. And I said, there's a robot on Mars. It's driving around all by itself. It took a photo of Mars and moons going in front of each other. And people are like, yeah. yeah. I'm like, no, no, that's not the right response. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> sure, that's fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> sip the coffee. <laughs> One of the single most incredible feats in human endeavor. And it's just something that appears on a scroll, um, you know, a sidebar of stuff. It's just something, science is now just something that happens. Discovered the Higgs boson, get brand new maps of the microwave background radiation of the entire visible universe. And it's like, oh yeah, that's a good picture. <laughs> I wonder what the Dominion posted the comic is today. And this, this weirdness just does my head at night. I don't get it, but I like bats. I love, absolutely love bats. So these are one of my other favorite things, because um, a lot of the outreach that I do I find space stuff really cool, but some of it is kind of hard to understand. And bats are really easy to understand because they're terrifying and also really cute. So this is a vampire bat. Uh, they have a little receptor on their nose that allows them to see into the infrared. That's the capsaicin receptor you can see on the left. Um, it also turns out it's almost identical to the chili receptor that you have on your tongue. So imagine that. Imagine being able to see with your nose like you taste with your tongue, but having it translated for your brain so it turns into some kind of vision and using that to land on a cow and then figure out where you're going to bite it. This isn't just kind of general hand wavy infrared, this is really, really specific and kind of gross. So this is where growing up on the farm has given me a, a, a wonderful ability and a horrible burden at the same time. See, I have no idea where the gross line is and I completely cross it all the time without, without any regard for human sanity or safety. But inspiration comes from everywhere and if you haven't seen this, I had to put this up, it has no relevance to the tool. This is a map of the archive. The archive is uh, an online, non-peer reviewed, which is why it's bad, but you know, we have it, so then there's people trying to apply peer review to it. It's uh, a map of 80, 870,000 articles that are on the archive. This is only one small section of science, and I apologize, I couldn't get a high resolution image. But the different colors are different regions of science. So your bottom left, yeah. That's math. That's pure math. Math for math's sake. The pinky thing up to the right, that's astrophysics. All of it. The blue stuff in the middle is high energy particle physics. It's the stuff that ties it all together. And that's just one part of science. You imagine trying to do this for biology, and I honestly don't believe you could. Just because everything is so connected, you need at least a three-dimensional map, if not going up to nth dimensions. 
This is, uh, this is Paperscape. Have a look at it. it. It only just got released through The Guardian a couple of days ago, but I hope this is going to go places because it looks amazing, even if you don't understand any of it, like me. The final part is critical thinking. And I'm hoping I don't have to tell a conference of skeptics why the proliferation of critical thinking is important for both human beings, uh, for society as a whole, and for individuals. Critical thinking is really important, particularly when children are involved. So, these are the three things that Geek Manifesto told me I had to go and do. Um, but it's kind of hard, because in my heart, if I'm honest, I'm, if you have a, if you look at this wonderful comment that I love, um, I'm a scientist, not a science advocate. And for me, just being able to do something, there's plenty of reason to kind of do it sometimes. Even if it has no reason, just because it is fucking awesome. <laughs> and it's become a huge learning curve for me to try and to translate that to people who aren't scientists, who need good reasons to fund and go and do things. So, this is my adventures into that. I'm an experimentalist. I'm horrible at math, even worse at theory. So, the only thing I figured I could do is go out and try some of these things. So I started, I got a job at Color Observatory, that's where I work, and here's my plug, this is the only marketing in my talk. Um, Pamela Gay and I are mostly Pamela. Uh, <laughs> I'm giving a talk at Color Observatory, um, on a, she's giving a talk on the preservation of our dark skies on Wednesday evening next week, so come along. Then I'm trying to break the planetarium software by soaring through the Milky Way and looking at pulsars and the proliferation of globular clusters and other bits and pieces, because it's freaking awesome. And you should come. Um, Peter and the rest of the Sidewalks team were so kind enough to give me a blog, which I now hardly ever use, but I blame that on my thesis, not because of anything else. Um, and if you haven't come across Sidewalks, it's an amazing site. Go, just have a look. Lose a day on it, learn something. Um, meet some of our amazing scientists. So, um, and I mean no offence by this. If you have a look around the room, I'd say there's, there's some demographics that are rather well represented. <laughs> and I feel that internationally, certain groups, of which I will become one in time, tend to dominate science. Uh, we find that a lot in Wellington. And just to, just to put it absolutely fine, old, balding, white men. <laughs> so now, two years, that's all I've got left. <laughs> Dad's ball, brother's ball, it's going. <laughs> Um, this is a traditional group that's well represented. Unfortunately, it's a group that has a complete monopoly on science talks. And for the Wellington branch of the Royal Society, uh, that's very much what it is. It's also quite exclusive. Not exclusive in that we only take the best. Exclusive as in, please go away and don't talk to us if you're an old, old white man. Um, so last year I came on board and told them that was rubbish. And I wanted to change it. And I've been trying to do that since then with very limited success. But two of the things we do do, we organise cafe scientific style talks. So what we do is we get a speaker, hopefully someone that's educated and well informed in a certain area. For instance, this week at Papa we had Russ Van Dissen, who's the head of the Geological and Nuclear Sciences uh, Division, who researches earthquakes and earthquake resilience, speaking at Papa. They give a 10 minute intro and then questions get fired on from the audience. I hated this format. I absolutely hated it. I asked, why? have some intelligent person only talk for 10 minutes on something that's so interesting. But now I've been doing these things and organising for a year, I completely understand. Because it's not about the science. It's not about Russ. It's about the audience. These are great. I understand that now I'm trying to get more like them happening. But unfortunately, because of their history, they tend to attract the same crowd. I now have a large number of 65-year-old white friends. <laughs> They're great, they're lovely people, they're, they're not exclusive, but when you have a group of those people getting young women and getting Maori and Pacific students and other people to join in, it's just a little bit scary. So I'm hoping to change that, but haven't had any real success yet. It's still a dead horse, but you know, we'll see. We might be able to vlog it some more, if you couldn't tell it, which it was. I've also experimented with podcasts, not doing any at the moment, um, but these things are great, because you can call someone and the large number of scientists around the world, you can literally drop an, drop an email and say, I'd like to talk to you and report it. And put it online for posterity. Unless they're really busy, most of them will say, hell yes, and come and do it. 
So we produce podcasts from here. It's easy to do. It's completely free most of the time. And there's some far more experienced podcasters than I in the audience. But these take time. They take preparation. And sometimes no one listens. <laughs> and it's also hard to tell sometimes whether people listen or not. So the reason I'm not doing any at the moment is simply because the ones we produce had a very low listenership. But they are a powerful tool. I have this thing where I don't think talking at people is hugely effective. And I fully appreciate the irony of saying that in a lecture theatre. <laughs> However, you know, sometimes you've got to work with what you have. So what we decided to do is we decided to have fun with people of all ages and particularly to do with space. Because space is cool. Space is something that everyone gets. Every child imagines space. Every adult thinks, yeah, I'd be so much more sexy if I was an astronaut. <laughs> Even though that's probably debatable looking at the astronauts, but... Anyway, so what we did is we took 120 odd people up the coast to a park. We camped up there. We spent the evening doing astronomy, a little bit of astrophysics, although I'm not technically allowed to say that. Um, we were going to do astrology, but the astrologer didn't turn up. <laughs> I don't know, perhaps they were Sagittarius. This is your wardrobe, I don't know what Sagittarius is like. Um, we had a great time. The, the Sunday, the Saturday morning, we launched rockets, we drove rovers around on the sand, and everyone, everyone who came said it was a fantastic time. And they hopefully learned it too. But we also do other stuff. Uh, we've also, along with Chorgal, which is uh, the local group that are helping do these things, although now they seem to do a lot more pseudoscience than they do actual science, but that's by the way, we did a group of 40 odd people, all different ages, all different genders, messing around with biology. And this is basic stuff. This is swallowing the inside of your mouth, staining it, and seeing what you can see under a microscope. Stuff that I'm sure many of you would have done in schools. Unfortunately, most of these people either hadn't done it in school, or had no memory of it whatsoever, because that was about 25 years ago. And it seems strange to me that something as simple and cheap as this doesn't happen. We lose that ability to see all the things that used to fascinate us in high school. And I think it's an absolute travesty. We've done plenty of more of these, by the way. We've done ones on climate change, and we've done various other bits and pieces. Some are well attended, some are appallingly attended. Uh, we've also started working with the Wellington Makerspace, because I am a geek, and I know that's probably hard to believe. <laughs> yes, laugh, laugh a lot, because I am the biggest geek. Um, we work with ripping apart cheap old junk and building it into scientific equipment. So I was doing this with the Capital City Science Educators last week, grabbing a power supply, hopefully not sitting on fire, uh, and turning it into standard voltages that you can use in a lab, because science teachers are fantastic, but they're strapped for cash like everyone else. And there's a lot of junk out there, so we are hoping to put those two together and actually create some real interesting science. Unfortunately, I've run that class twice, and so far six people have turned up. That's, that's total, that's not her class. So, um, you know, perhaps that's not one of the successful ones. But this is the big part of what I do. So I do a lot of these different little things because I like to try different little things and see if they work. My, my workforce, what I spend most of my time doing is going out to schools and talking about science and doing it. And it is without a doubt the best part of my job. It's part I'm not paid for. It's part I'm actively discouraged to do because it tends to impinge on my paper writing time. But it is the best. Absolutely the best. Going, in, going into a school and putting up the Im in, image of the Crab Nebula, which is that four panel image up there, and saying this is the same thing. It's the same image, just taken with different colours. And kids are going, what? No, it's not. <laughs> Don't be stupid. One of them's an explosion, the other one's a spinning top, and the other one looks like a bad acid trip. <laughs> what are you talking about? And that's one nebula. That's one supernova remnant. It's thousands across the sky. Thousands of more interesting things, radio telescopes to discover. And kids get science, they get curiosity, and most of them, give them a little bit of leeway, particularly, particularly year nines and tens, get skepticism. I'm sure if there's any teaches it, you can say that sometimes kids are very, very skeptical about anything you tell them to do, and won't do it for any reason whatsoever. <laughs> um, but they get it, and what bothers me is that somehow, with so many kids getting science and curiosity and small amounts of skepticism, 
We turn it out of them. So many people lose it. Don't know when. The Royal Society of New Zealand has done some research that says when kids stop getting their interest, when they lose it, it's around about the 10 or 11 year old age group mark. I'm doing some work on that, but I think it's a travesty that we lose it. And that so few of us get the opportunity, like me, to work in a field where you're constantly discovering things and telling people about the joy of plain old discovery. The other part of what we do is, is just image. Google scientist or engineer. Scientist is white man who have no glasses. Engineer is even funnier because all you need is a hard hat, a suit, and a piece of paper. A roll up, it has to be rolled up. If it's laid out, not an engineer, roll up. Um, and is, so for me, science and engineering are they're, they're different fields, but they're intimately linked, right? And having wonderful rock stars like Commander Chris Hatfield floating. <laughs> Singing David Bowie from the International Space Station, or having people like Adafruit, who's playing on the keyboard of, I believe, a Commodore 64 there, which she's converted into a bass guitar. <laughs> then it's awesome. Science or engineering, I don't care, that's just really, really cool. And the guy down the bottom is a Kiwi guy who is hacking networks with stuff, so we won't mention him. But it's happening everywhere. These people are doing it, and a lot of people don't understand that. The image of science and engineering is changing, slowly, and we have to keep forcing it because it's not going to keep changing by itself, not in my view. And another one of my hats is Te Roku Afina. So, Te Roku Afina is a Victoria University farm, it's a family for Māori Pacific students. Because, like I said, typically older white males have the dominant in, in academia. Imagine coming in as a brand new student and going through four years of lectures in your engineering course, let's say for argument's sake, and seeing not a single Māori Pacific student in your class, definitely not a single Māori Pacific lecturer. What if you're a female Māori Pacific student? Are you going to feel like the odd one out or what? So a lot of the work that I do is talking to Māori Pacific students trying to tell them that this is a career pathway that they can achieve, because they're certainly not stupid. And trying to acclimatise them to the traditional Pākehā environment. And unfortunately, I'm an old white male. <laughs> it's, I'm not the one that should be telling them this. <laughs> and anything that comes out of my mouth is completely rubbish with regards to how they feel and how they experience a lot of the education that some of us take for granted. Um, particularly in New Zealand, we have a huge divide between the level of academic success in Asian and Pākehā populations and Māori and Pacific populations. There's, there's data on it everywhere. Uh, a good link in an article that we tried to do some studies on our effect is down the bottom there. You can talk to me afterwards if you want a free copy because it's behind a paywall. Um, but this is a really serious issue, particularly as those two demographic groups grow. One is growing at a much, much faster rate than the other, and I'm willing to bet you can all guess which one it is. And here's the thing. I don't actually believe that any of this stuff has any measurable evolved effect. And I find that terrifying. All the stuff that I do, I do it in part because it's fun. Another part I do it because I believe in it. I'm very, very sceptical at the long-term social effect that it actually has. So let me try and explain why, because that's a horrible statement. I don't like making it. Well, I do, because it's good news. <laughs> but the biggest problem I have found behind it is that, particularly in McDermott and in New Zealand, we pride ourselves about doing quality science. Right? If you put us in the fields of engineering, physics, astrophysics, biology, our science is good. It's as good as the rest of the world. For some research, it's not mine, but you know, the people I work with, they're all good scientists. Not one bad apple counts for a lot, surely. But with outreach, we don't measure it. We barely even started to try. I can tell you how many people turn up to my talks. I can't tell you how many of those people go away and have their opinions changed. More importantly, with the talks that I hold, including Cafe Scientific and Science Express, it's the same demographic. The same people turn up every month. And that's great, that makes me feel wonderful about myself. 
But unfortunately, that's not getting to any of the people that need that information. And the reason I care is that if we don't get the information out to the people that need it, and if it doesn't go in, and if it doesn't stay there, then there is a chance that people like me, particularly me, are actually part of the problem, not part of the solution. I hope I'm not being too contentious here, but I believe skepticism about everything is good. And that includes skepticism about my own efficacy and the efficacy of science outreach in general. And I do not believe that it is anywhere near as effective as we are led to believe. And that's because I think, for me, it's, it's based on two assumptions. Right? If you go and you organise science outreach, a science outreach event, one assumption is that giving people more, better quality information leads to them making better decisions. Of all the people you know, how many does that accurately describe? I know the probability of me winning a lottery. And yet, occasionally, when I'm written down, I will go and buy a lottery ticket. Even though it makes no sense at all to me um, or to any other people. Sometimes decisions aren't based on good information. And the other assumption is that if you give people information, they will remember it. And that's just straight up wrong. Well, incomplete. Because a lot of studies are showing, and I apologise, I'm really looking forward to Matt's talk from the psychology department. Um, a lot of research is showing that what you retain, what you remember, is not necessarily linked to the factual basis behind that piece of information. I'm wearing a red shirt. I can almost guarantee that that will have some impact on how well you remember me and the facts that I supposedly spout during this talk. Probably has something to do with how much anger you remember as well. Or not doing. There are so many factors that influence what we retain and what we remember that we aren't accounting for and we aren't even studying. Yet we spend all this time doing outreach without knowing any of them. Um, these are some of the examples. Um, I'm going to point out here that I am not a psychologist or a sociologist. I've done a small amount of reading and take everything I say here with a grain of salt. I want to make that absolutely explicitly clear because I'm one of these physicists that's going into an area that I shouldn't. And uh, you can see how that ends up with some of the Nobel Prize winners. <laughs> Challenging someone's belief, even if you provide it with evidence, doesn't always change their opinion. Sometimes when you push someone's back up against the wall, it just gets their hackers up and entrenches it more. There's plenty of studies showing that. Memorability of information, as I said, is only in barely linked to how factual that information is. And a wonderful piece of research that Peter, Peter Griffin from Science Media Center sent out last year shows that the repetition of, of myths, mostly when we're trying to debunk them, right? Homeopathy is bad, homeopathy is bad, homeopathy is bad. If you repeat it enough, they just don't remember the homeopathy. <laughs> they don't remember the is bad bit, which one would argue might be the important bit. <laughs> we need to be really careful when we do science outreach that we're doing the right stuff. Because there are a lot of ways in which we could, and probably are, making the problem worse. And humans just complicated, you know? Everyone is different. I can talk about the general public and I can wave my hands and talk about demographics, but it doesn't matter. Each person is going to make their own decision entirely individually. And that's something that not enough of our science outreach programs accurately address. And this is why it's important. So, <laughs> yeah, you're not meant to read this slide. <laughs> uh, this is, this is a, a recent summary uh, given to me by the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment. The lovely people there actually allowed me to present up on Cyclops. There's a copy up there, or I can give you one. But it's a map of all the science outreach they know that is going on around New Zealand. And it's attempted to be clustered, not in any kind of mathematical way, not like how they clustered the, the archive papers. It's just kind of put together with coloured lines. Um, but it gives you an idea of how many people and how many different groups are going about science outreach in New Zealand. There's heaps of them. That's really, really encouraging for me. But almost none of them are actually studying it and looking how effective they are 
and try to make themselves more efficient in the outreach that they do. And so a whole huge pool of government money is going into funding this stuff. That's great, that's fantastic, I believe in it. But I'm not convinced that all of it is making things better, rather than making it worse. So, and I apologise because I've gone much quickly, much more quickly than I intended to, but hopefully there's some time for discussion and questions anyway. I need your help. Because this is something, hopefully, obviously I passionately believe in. I don't know anything about testing. I know a little bit about evidence gathering, and I know when it's not going on. And that's what's happening here. But if you have any ideas, any suggestions, any hypotheses, hypotheses that you think we could test, I would genuinely love to hear about them. Because we need, we need, and by we, I mean the human species. I don't just mean Kiwis. That would be a nice place to start. But the human species in general. We need to figure out how to make this work. Because it's not just a matter for us. Again, hopefully most of you have seen this. It's the image of Earth taken from Saturn. And they're trying to uh, semi-recreate the, the pale blue dot photo that Carl Sagan had with the Voyager 2. One of the Voyager probes that was going past Saturn. That dot with the arrow going to it in the left is Earth. That's, that's, that's the whole thing. You've already seen today the implications of climate change whether you're a skeptic or whether you're a believer or what's the matter. Our home is a spaceship. And it's the only spaceship we have. Okay, we have a few others. But they were last operational with humans to Mars. That, that was back in the 70s, right? It was quite some time ago. And I think if we tried to fit 6 billion people onto, say, Apollo 11, we might have a little bit of a problem. It's a spaceship that we desperately need to look after and we desperately need to understand better. Even if something like climate change and the predictions are completely out the window, it doesn't matter. Over long scale time periods, the Earth's climate changes dramatically. And at some point, we are going to have to take control of our spaceship and decide what we want it to look like. And this is in all likelihood not going to be on the time scale of hundreds of millions of years. For it to be habitable to humans and fun for us to live in and work around, the time scale is much smaller. So this is something that we need to instill. And I want to learn, hopefully, how to do it better by being a little bit curious about us and how we learn. But I'm going to finish up there. I hope you have enjoyed my talk. I apologise for hand waving and person. Um, are there any questions? Okay, so do we have any questions for Dal? Yes, thank you very much for your talk. Um, what comes to my mind when I hear you trying to um, get into an outreach position with science in New Zealand, it may well apply to the rest of the world, I don't know, but I'm live here, so. In the New Zealand context, it would seem to me that there is a huge vacuum in the public broadcasting area of science. So is there any um, sign of interest from a public broadcaster in science and science education? Not that I'm aware of. There is, it, it, it's entirely possible that there are plans going on that I don't know about. Despite the fact that I, I look um, somewhat omni, omnipotent, uh, I'm not. <laughs> um, I know there is a huge amount of interest in that from both the public and from science leaders and people like that I've been talking to recently. Uh, we did have the wonderful program hosted by uh, John Watt on TVNZ7, which has since now gone, um, which a lot of people really, really positively reacted to from all different walks of life. But unfortunately that has gone and I'm not aware of anything else coming in to fill that. But I agree, that's that's a, a real a real crying shame and not that I'm aware of, unfortunately. Shall we make more? Um, I'm trying to frame this as a question so I don't get yelled at by James. <laughs> uh, have you heard of the Inspiring Australia efforts in Australia? I've heard 
food for them, I'm not sure what they okay, are. Okay, I've just tweeted you a link. This might be what you're looking for because Australia's put a lot of money into <coughs> assessing science outreach. And what they're doing is providing programs, providing resources for Australian scientists to assess the effectiveness of science outreach. So that might be a solution. If you haven't looked at it before, question mark. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Health, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, one of the things that I don't think you touched on in, in this, but is potentially one of the biggest or most expensive science outreach things that's happened in the last year in New Zealand is the National Science Challenges. And you were involved on the panel alongside Sir Peter Blackman and other scientists evaluating some of the proposals and looking at what could be the top 10 science challenges. How effective do you think that is in terms of, of a, a major outreach program? There's a million dollar ad campaign for that. New Zealanders got to, to vote uh, or put in their ideas for those top 10 challenges. Do you think that is going to be effective long term as a science outreach program? Uh, that's a really, really good question, Peter. Uh, I'm, I'm split in two minds about it. Uh, a number of people I've spoken to said, oh yeah, those are the ads with the pink haired girl, right? and had no idea they were actually asking for information at all. Other people said, yeah, no, I thought long and hard about it, and I wrote in a really detailed proposals, which I was then able to read, uh, that were really, really compelling. And it's, it was always going to be a re I don't know if I should say that. Screw up, say it anyway. Um, it was always going to be a really tough ask to do, particularly on time frames and budgets. Um, and I'm glad that it has been done, it would be amazing if it kept happening. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm trying to really, yeah, pay contracts saying I won't talk too much about it, but it's something I believe could be effective. Uh, it would be a really expensive way of continually doing it, but even as recently as I have a Victoria advert on TV with me at the moment, and the impact of that, because I'm isolated in my own little world, don't watch TV, um, the impact of just something like a, a one and a half minute advert on TV to such a broad demographic range is so far above and beyond uh, what I could have even imagined. I think if that's something that we seriously want to look at, then there would be few better ways of, of starting a dialogue process. But it would need to be continuously done, I feel. Just thinking how to frame this. Um, all my sins, I'm a companion of the Royal Society of New Zealand. That's a group of about, we're up to about 40, I think, of people who've been involved in science promotion over the last 20 odd years. I would be interested in hearing your thoughts on how to maintain enthusiasm for science outreach in the light of the apparent lack of any continuation, uh, uptake, or interest. Because I know that at one stage the companions were saying, why are we doing this? We're not going to do this anymore. We're fed up with going out to schools and having no response. We're fed up with trying to get these kinds of communication strategies into place at a government level or a media level and having no response. So I'd be really interested. It's invigorating to see young people like yourself <laughs> expressing the enthusiasm, but how do you keep it up through all the stages and the fact that we don't have any kind of um, ongoing strategy for this sort of thing? That's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, one I could talk about for hours and hours and hours. Uh, so, first thing is that I am of the belief, and I have no data, I apologise, I only have anecdotes to back this up, but I am of the belief that in the current crop of postgraduate students that I'm involved with, there are always new ones popping out that are willing to go and do this. And importantly, they're willing to go and do it at uh, the expense of their personal career development. Um, there is a, if any of you have kids that are at all associated with Victoria, there is one fantastic girl from the McDevitt Institute called Andrea who does wall doping. She's not only organised kids to come in, she's written a whole experiment and done nanotechnology with kids that are 11 and 12 years old and doped a piece of wall to a different colour. This is a technology that's only been developed in the last couple of years. And she's done that all under her own state with her supervisor actively trying to discourage her from doing it. So I think it's almost something that you can't stop. However, um, there is also a large, so as a postgraduate student, we feel a large push from the wider science community to do more, which is good. Um, but I 
think the problem is that currently a lot of the a lot of the calls we hear are for more people to be doing it more often. My argument is to flip that on its head and go support the people that are doing it to do it better, and then more people will do it. That is uh, that's certainly how I would feel because it does feel going through postgraduate work that. Some people actively discourage it, some people passively discourage it. Um, everyone says, when you get on TV, when you write a blog, when there's some, something good coming from it, everyone says, yeah, well, that's great, go and do more. But you know, they, don't, they don't give you a car, they don't give you a list of schools, they don't say, here's all the experiments you need, go and, you know, go and do them for a week and travel around New Zealand. Um, I feel that supporting the people that do really want to do it is a good place to start, and then more people will become more attracted to it. I think that only answers part of your question. Um, but that's so that's for postgraduate students. For uh, for actual scientific researchers, that's a much more tricky one. There's some scientific researchers in particular I would never ever 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 want to see at school. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are some that I would I would happily pay to go to a school. And the fact of the matter is some scientists, and it has no bearing on, on their scientific acumen, are better at it than others. Some enjoy it more and some enjoy it less. And there's no way we should make the people that don't want to do it or that are awful at doing it go out and do it. Uh, that's, that's why I sit on the promote the ones that do to do it better uh, side of the fence. The other problem there is that, again, all of the, all of the funding, all of the career development is all stacked up through PBRF towards putting publishing papers, going out and actually uh, interacting with the community isn't something that you get any money or any career development for doing. That said, uh, as Peter said earlier on, uh, there is one of the National Science Challenges called the Science and Society Challenge. Uh, the conversation behind the closed doors and my interaction with that was really encouraging to say the least. Um, to know that that is being considered and talked about and people are trying to change it at the highest levels that they have access to, that's encouraging. But I'm also young and incredibly naive. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't believe how naive I am. So, it's I, I, in three years. I, yeah, I'll celebrate <laughs> when there's a science and society van that I can jump into and drive out to a school and do a whole bunch of experiments with kids for a day. Um, at the moment it's a pipe dream, but it's a pipe dream that is being talked about, so it's better than not being talked about. The sad thing about the companion rules model is that the subtext was we don't want to actually encourage kids into science at all because of the way much science is being done in New Zealand and the whole policy and working um, environment that can go downhill as we see right now. Can I can't answer that? Because uh, we have time for a rush. <laughs> naughty, naughty, that wasn't the format, but it's, it's, a, it's a good point that allows me to raise something I wanted to raise anyway. Um, you also have to understand that the very nature of science is changing. It, it's, it's completely different now. So there's people like me uh, who would much rather uh, have a 9 to 5 job, get paid a chunk of money, and then turn off and go home and do science in my basement, or work on an amazing project in, with my friends in my spare time because that gives me complete creative control. I'm not going to get any money for it, it's going to cost me money to do, but it's something that I love to do, just because it's interesting. And I think as the world becomes more connected, and I hope, as the world changes, perhaps that will become citizen science, uh, will become a more common way of doing science than the traditional scientist roles that we have now. Um, I like that because it gives me the freedom to play with fluid dynamics. When that's not what I should be doing for my PhD. <laughs> okay, we'll just have uh, one last question over there. Thanks for talking. Well, um, have you, are you aware of the work we've done in my own school by Dr. Karen Marlfeld because it's been successful long term? Oh, I'm not. Please, I'd like to come talk to you. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>